Morning, my name is Arthur Sabinsev. I'm one of the lead devs at the Washington Post, and I'm here today to talk to you about scale and how we're scaling our mobile team and our mobile apps. Uh, so you may think to yourself in the era of fake news and the era of a dying print industry, how we have found ourselves to be in a position where we are fortunate enough to have to scale and scale quickly. Well, all of this can kind of be pointed back to this man, Jeff Bezos. Big, big Jeff Bezos. Uh, if you don't know who he is, he's the CEO of Amazon. He's also the founder of Blue Origin, which is a spaceflight company, kind of like Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX. Um, and he owns the Washington Post as a personal investment, meaning that we are not a subsidiary of Amazon. We are just owned by Jeff. Um, and that means we make extremely heavy use of AWS because it's very easy for him to take money from one of his investments and put them in the other investment. Um, so uh, why, what's, how has Jeff changed the company? So he came and bought the company in 2013. For the record, I joined the company in 2015. Um, and he's done essentially one main thing, which is he has grown the engineering team to a couple hundred engineers. And the reason he's done that is he's tried to uh, put us into more uh, verticals. So we have a special partnership with Apple and Apple News and, okay. Sorry, this thing keeps going in and out. Um, so we have a special partnership with Apple and Apple News. And um, if you've seen any of the keynotes or WWDC, we're usually in one of them or in all of them every single year. We have a special partnership with Google and Google AMP. We have a special partnership with Facebook for Facebook Instant, um, Snapchat Discover. Um, we have our own newsletter technology, our own video technology, our own ads platform, analytics platform. None of this would have existed if Bezos didn't come and um, take over the company. Um, so, what did our mobile stack look like before uh, Bezos purchased the company? Well, there were um, a bunch of apps, but these were three of the main apps. Um, so, the white app, the print edition app, um, it's an e-paper app. It used to only work on the iPad, um, and it was a newsstand app. Um, and the, the, so the, the way the app worked was it was just a bunch of PDFs that were bundled into the app, and you could read the newspaper on your tablet. The black app, our flagship app, also known as the classic app, um, it was just a phone app, and at some point it was just web views built by a bunch of contractors, and then over time it became owned internally, and now it's totally owned internally and is our flagship app. And then we have DC Rider, which was a metro app that we abandoned many years ago, but recently we just rebuilt it from scratch, um, and it's a, um, it's a metro specific app, tells you how to go, where to go, how much things cost, and serves news. Since acquisition, we have a lot more apps. This is just a small snapshot of them. So the print edition app is now a universal e-paper app. The classic app is a universal flagship app that does a lot of experimentation. We, have, um, uh, we had Uber integration for six months in there. You would hop in an Uber, get a push notification. It would launch the Washington Post app, and you would get free news. Uh, so it was for non-subscribers as well. Um, and then DC Rider now serves ads and has its own editorial team. We have at least one editor that just writes news for this app. Um, then we had a video game at some point called Flappy Candidate, which was a, um, sorry, uh, which was a Flappy Bird clone for the elections. It was featured on the App Store many times. We have an app for recruiting people. Um, so instead of talk HR talking to you on the phone, they'll send you an app uh, linked to iOS, Android, or the web, and you answer a bunch of questions and take a couple videos of yourself um, and describe why you want this specific job, and then you go through the entire funnel. And then we have our latest news app. Well, it's three years old now. It's called Rainbow. Um, or the Washington Post app, and it has a completely different editorial team. It's geared towards millennials. It has a magazine-style presentation. Um, it has a lot more pop culture news, um, uh, more celebrity news, shorter form articles. It's geared more uh, towards the general public. Um, the flagship app is more of um, local, national, does some international news as well, and the print edition is for uh, folks in a different generation. Um, so this, not all of this is, you know, all of this has attributed us to becoming profitable, which we are, I can publicly say that, we are a, public, a profitable newspaper company. Um, however, this has led us and the entire engineering team to a brand new endeavor, and that brand new endeavor is known as Arc Publishing. Uh, so Arc Publishing is our software as a service um, initiative. So we essentially have a company within our company. Think AWS to Amazon, right? AWS is just a white label, templatable version of all of Amazon's services resold to the general public. That is exactly what is going on here. We have taken our back-end stack, front-end stack, analytics stack, mobile stack, re-architected all of it, and are now selling to other publishers. So do we have customers? 
Yes, we do. Um, this is just a small snapshot of the customers I can talk about. So we have Trunk, which is the New York Daily News and the Chicago Tribune and a bunch of other properties. We have at the LA Times, the Boston Globe, and we're international as well. We work, in, uh, we work with Canada with the Globe and Mail and um, Infobuy in Argentina. And we have a lot more going on. Um, so what this really comes down to is we are, now building mobile, we are now building and maintaining native mobile applications for other newspaper publishers. Um, in analogy form, we are Facebook and we are building and supporting Twitter or Spotify or any other social network-ish style platform, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, so being the first engineer on this platform, I, um, you know, I was given the opportunity to name this project. Um, and being given that honor and knowing how hard naming things is, I thought about it long and hard. And as we had a project called Rainbow, I figured we need a project called Unicorn. <laughs> so uh, internally, we have a bunch of names for this app. And that's a lot of it is my fault because I kept pushing the Unicorn name and it didn't really budge because our sales team can't go out to um, the cu different customers and be like, hey, we have this great mobile apps team. They build this thing called Unicorn. Would you like to buy it? Doesn't work. Um, so we've settled on the name Arc Mobile. The reason I bring this up is because throughout this talk, I will slip up and say the white label app, Arc Mobile, Arc, Arc Native, or Unicorn, they all mean the same thing, this templatable native mobile application. This is our unofficial logo that I got off DeviantArt. Um, it is on all our Jira, Confluence instances, and even on our sample apps. Um, so we're Team Unicorn. So <laughs> what is the Unicorn uh, Arc Mobile app? It's our classic app. Uh, uh, rebuilt from the bottom up in Swift. Uh, when we started with Swift 3, now it's Swift 4. And all the libraries that are underneath it, which I'll explain in a few slides, also re-architected to be re um, reused in a templatable fashion. So which apps are currently powered by Unicorn? So currently, the Globe and Mail app, the Salt Lake Tribune app, the New York Daily News app, and the LA Times are in the store, um, and they are um, powered using the Unicorn SDKs. Um, we are almost done with the Chicago Tribune app. Actually, we're done. We're just waiting for them to release it. And in a couple months, we will also release the Boston Globe. And in the early fall, we have 45 apps for an unnamed, unmentionable client that are going to go out the door. Um, we, when they do go out, we'll have about 50 apps in the store that are powered by this unicorn library, all in use category, many of which are in the top 100 or 200 apps in that category. So we are slowly starting to own the top news apps in the App Store. So what are the unicorn-powered apps? What do they actually look like? So this is the launch screen. The, this is the home screen that you land on, also known as the section front screen, for each app. On the left, for reference, is the Washington Post app. And then we have the Globe and Mail app, the Salt Lake Tribune app, and the LA Times app. And as you see, data can be presented differently. They can be themed slightly differently. They, all, they have some slightly different iconography. Some have ads right away. Some don't. Um, and if you were to download all these apps and play with them, you'll see that there's a lot of similarities, but they still are functionally different in many places. Um, so in building these apps, the way we started is we essentially started as a product company. And we told our clients, we are going to take the Washington Post app, and we are going to reskin this for you, and we are going to drive our own roadmap. Unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to think about it, um, we have turned into an agency where we essentially are now saying yes to a lot of features we didn't plan on saying yes to because we realize as the Washington Post, while we operate a certain way, our partners, our clients, they have different expectations and hopes. So we've had to really, really re-architect and really expand on what is customizable in this application. Um, needless to say, we were not prepared um, for what, 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 uh, what, was, um, what was going to happen. For those of you who don't get the reference, this is a character from a game, uh, Warcraft, that screams at all the players for 10 years now. You're not prepared to do X or Y. Um, so we were not prepared for the customization. However, I think we've done a pretty good job. This is a snapshot of our Fabric dashboard. We are at 99.9 or 100% crash free all the time. Um, so I think at scale, we've been able to rebuild everything and still be able to scale properly and still be able to maintain 99%, um, what's it called, crash free across the board. And when the apps do crash, it's honestly third-party libraries, not us. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the structure of a news app. Um, so there, there are many screens in a news app. I want to call out six that I think are the most important. First, you have the section fronts. So our section fronts are essentially, what is a section front is, is what I should explain first. Um, a section front is essentially the equivalent, it's just a summary of the top news articles for a specific section. So if you open up the A page or B page 
of a newspaper, it would be just that first page with a couple headlining articles. And when it says, you know, continue on AO5, that's the same thing as clicking on a section front and going to an article. Our section fronts have the actual um, content, pictures, et cetera, and then you have a little bar right below the nav bar that lets you go through the top sections. So home, Canada, world for the Globe and Mail, and so on. Um, when you click on an article, you get to an article. Our article pages can have ads, videos, can have Twitter embeds, Instagram embeds. Um, they can have uh, images, image galleries, videos that play inline. They're super customizable. Um, so and every partner does it differently. Uh, we also have a section list. So this is Salt Lake Tribune app, an older screenshot of it, but still. We have section lists, so you have a list of all the sections and subsections and sub-subsections that you can see in the app and render natively. We have search. Um, so this is the LA Times app. We search for Kardashian because that's an easy search result for the LA Times, and you get a lot of news. Um, so typically, you know, we have search results. Saved articles, let's say you see that great headline, but you have to go into a meeting. You can just save it and read it later. And the most important screen, in my opinion, is the push, uh, segmented push notification screen. We live in a day and age where a push notification can cause an uninstall, um, and iOS 12 is going to remedy that with um, special things that they're putting in place into the push notification libraries. And one of the things that we try to do is to um, allow people to subscribe into or out of funnels so that the editorial team doesn't get trigger happy and send pushes to everyone. And our, our stack also supports um, temporary events, such as uh, elections, the World Cup, Olympics, so you can subscribe in and out of temporary push notifications so you don't have to send it as breaking news alerts. Um, so all of this has led to kind of breaking down our app customization options into these categories. So we have, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of break them down and explain what's going on. So the Washington Post, when we started, we essentially sold one type of ad, uh, medium rectangle ad, 300 by 225 pixels. Um, <clears throat> but be, most of our partners, they want more ads. They want tons of ads. They want leaderboard ads. They want interstitial ads. They want adhesion ads. They want ads when you launch the app. They want ads when you come back to the app. Ads everywhere. Google, uh, DFP, double click for publishers, soon to be known as Google Marketing, um, uh, doesn't scale to all of those, so we now have to support multiple third-party SDKs, and as we all know, the more SDKs you add, the more bugs you add. Uh, other companies have a paywall. Unfortunately, we, at, on Arc, we don't have our own paywall that we can sell, so we have to make do with every third-party client, sorry, every partner's in-house paywall system, which most of them don't follow standards. Some of them only use web views. Some of them only want OAuth. Some want social network logins. Some use third-party vendors that also don't work or are not documented pretty well. Some also have some really janky rules. Um, uh, I'll give you one that's my favorite. So for push notifications, and I think it's the LA Times, let's say you have 10 free articles and you get through all those uh, 10 articles. Um, when you, when you were to click on an 11th article, you would be metered or blocked. And it would say, hey, you need to pay money to read articles until your 30 days is up. Well, if you happen to have been one of those users and you still have that app installed because you like to only read 10 articles a month, um, and you get a push notification, they want that push notification article to be readable by everyone, subscribers and non-subscribers. So what we do now is we take that push notification article and we store it in a separate cache for 24 hours. And after 24 hours, um, that article is then uh, what's called busted from the cache, and you can no longer read it. So if you happen to save that article and not come back to it for 24 hours, well, you're free to, uh, to read that, uh, the ability to read that article for free is gone. So we have this special rule that is um, paid for everyone unless it's in a push notification and available to everyone for 24 hours, but then it's gone for everyone unless you're a paid user again. That is a really stupidly busted rule that we had to program, but we did it in a very generic manner where we can now do it for an, any amount of, any period of time. We can make articles um, free the entire time, or we can make articles free for a certain period of time for everyone. But this is the, the idea that I'm trying to get to is as, as we scale, we've had to build different sets of rules that we would have never done internally for ourselves. And the other things that we have to do, we have to theme. Theme is very big, and I have a few slides about that in a little bit. And we've now added the ability to support traffic and weather. So we, these are the main things that you need to be able to customize when you're scaling. So let's get into some really, really high, high-level architecture. Um, these are not all of our libraries. These arrows actually are a little more convoluted. I just needed to make a clean image. Um, so let's talk about this. What is our app? Our app is just a bunch of JSON configuration files and a couple Swift structs that conform to dozens of protocols. Um, the actual app is a library called CoreKit, um, formerly known as UnicornKit, but then we had to rename it. 
Um, so uh, <laughs> CoreKit is an actual app that conforms to tons of different uh, protocols. And at the, the default setting for all those protocols falls back to the Washington Post app. So CoreKit is a the Washington Post classic app rebuilt from scratch in Swift that depends on all of our downstream pods, of which this is only a small snapshot. That default implementation is the Washington Post app with respect to theme, content, paywall rules, push rules, et cetera. Um, below that is PostKit. Um, and I'm going to air some dirty laundry right now because everyone loves that. Uh, PostKit is our, um, is our behemoth monolithic library that initially was built before my time. And the goal of it was to um, interact with the Washington Post APIs and render content, hence the name PostKit. Um, so right now, what it does is it interacts with our article API and our section front API, and recently our section serving API, the ones that makes all the, the pretty jump bar sections and the section list sections. Uh, it interacts with an image API. It has multiple caches. It also renders content. It also renders embeds. It does it for two different styles of apps, the classic app and the rainbow style app. Um, it also serves all sorts of types of ads, sends different types of analytics, and has two separate theming engines built into it. It is a very big project that we've just kind of been adopting and kicking the can down the road. But thankfully, we are getting to the point where we are um, scaling where we need to change this. So one of the things that we're talking about doing is turning PostKit into two separate libraries. One that being the network and caching layer, let's just call it post service, and one being the UI layer called post UI. Um, and to start this process, we began taking a lot of the shared caching technology and a parsing technology we have in there, and we moved it to this library we have called Utility Belt, which is a Swiss army knife library of extensions and protocols that we use for all of our um, Libraries. I only have two arrows because it's mainly used in CoreKit and Paywall, but it's slowly creeping into every library. Um, another library that we have is called Logger, which I didn't draw arrows because it would go to every single library that we have. And the whole point of Logger is to send error and warning logs to a dashboard um, on, the, on, the, on the web. So in case there are problems with for specific users logging in or in case there are some crash reports coming in, this would be redundancy around Crashlytics and allow us to pinpoint what crash paths um, are being entered. Um, yeah, so this is a, at a high level what our stack look like, looks like. So let's get into some code. Um, so we have this file that lives in every app at the app level. Remember, the app level is the config files and the protocol conformance files. Um, it's called partner.swift. However, we don't call it partner.swift. We call it WashingtonPost.swift, BostonGlobe.swift, LATimes.swift, depending on the app that it's in. And its structure is essentially a, it's a singleton, and it has two substructures, one around colors and one around fonts. So the colors are the primary, secondary, tertiary, um, um, and uh, uh, accent colors that a partner wants, and the fonts are the fonts that are used to render the app Chrome, like the various buttons or the content, the bylines, the quote lines, the paragraphs, um, the sections, uh, the articles, et cetera. Um, and then from there, we have a bunch of files, dozens of files, each of which conforms to one protocol. Um, and that protocol, and what we do in each of those protocols is we, um, uh, what's it called? <laughs> we override the various default Washington Post style implementations to, um, to add special customization. So all these protocols have one of have two naming structures. They either are a managing protocol or they are a themable protocol. A managing protocol deals with downstream libraries that control analytics, ads, push notifications, and themable protocols deal with the actual customization, visual UI style of protocols. And each of these managing protocols and themable protocols have a manager that exists that is sprinkled across at the core kit level. And, I'll, and you'll see in another example in a couple of slides of uh, and is referenced, um, references all these um, overri overridden conformed um, changes that you make. So let's give you an example of what one of these protocols looks like. So this is Washington Post plus partner managing .swift, or LA Times plus partner managing .swift. And this is just a small snapshot of the different toggles of what partner managing does. So partner managing specifically has three styles of toggles, feature toggles, so we can turn search off and turn paywall off, or turn them both on if the customer wants them. So that enables or disables entire flows. Sorry. <laughs> um, <coughs> we have a thing called offline mode, which essentially means don't download content over 3G. 
um, we have a legal toggle. So GDPR in, um, in Europe, if, you're, if, your app is, uh, if you're launching the app in Europe and you haven't given us consent, we'll pop up a modal and turn off tracking until you turn it on, until you accept the GDPR modal. If you don't accept the GDPR modal, you can't use the app. It's kind of how that works. Um, and then we have cost saving toggles. So search on user input. So this is like type ahead. So if you don't know what type ahead is, as some, there, there is a, a way to do search where you start, as you type the result, it would begin searching, um, begin performing search queries. So let's say your search end, results, end result search query is Trump. You type in TRU, you start getting results for truth, true, Trump, et cetera. Um, you t type in TRUM, you get uh, more, uh, more um, specific results, and then you finish off with Trump. Um, however, it, while, when you do that, you make three round trip requests. So you end up having to do more, uh, you use more bandwidth. And why this is important is search comes built into the Arc platform. You don't pay for it. You pay for bandwidth usage. So at scale, turning on type ahead search or search on user input could potentially cost the user three, four, five times more than if they had just asked the user to push the enter or done or send button on the keyboard performing a search result. We have lots of knobs to tweak. I mean, we have dozens just in this file. Overall, you'll see slowly how many knobs we have as I get through this talk. But this is the idea of how we're doing things. Everything is dependency injected via protocols. So let's go through how the dependency injection actually works. So CoreKit is an app, right? It has Core App Delegate. Core App Delegate defines a bunch of setup functions and a bunch of variables. What we do in the partner apps, so in Washington Post App Delegate and the Washington Post app, or LA Times App Delegate and the LA Times app, is we override the partner app and we put in that structure, partner.swift or um, LA Times.swift. Then, in did finish launching with options, we have a bunch of setup functions, setup as, setup analytics, and setup partner. What we do is we take a manager, so every managing and themable protocol has a manager, and we say, hey, set the singleton, partner manager current partner. Check to see if partner conforms to partner managing. If it does, great. Use all the customizations that are defined uh, in that partner.swift file. Otherwise, um, just use the default setting. So what's the default setting look like? Well, partnermanager.swift is essentially three lines of code. It declares a singleton, and on the right side, you just set what the default partner is. And that default partner is just the default implementation of uh, a protocol. So you either get customization, via dependency injection through protocol conformance, or you get the default implementation that ships with CoreKit or Analytics Kit or PushKit or all these other libraries. So that's kind of how it works. So let's get into theming or protocol-oriented theming, which I will air a little bit more dirty laundry. This is my doing and this is my fault. Um, protocol-oriented theming in theory is awesome if you have like 20 knobs to tweak that will never change. However, when you scale to 400 knobs across multiple libraries, it is a pain in the ass to deal with. Why? Because you can't keep track of renamed variables, new variables, or deprecated methods because Swift doesn't allow you to do any type of deprecation. If you happen to rename a variable or add a new variable, your upstream conformance file that conforms to it is going to be pretty happy with it because it doesn't care. Um, it won't tell you if you're missing a conformance because you have, we have default implementations for everything because we preferred, that was our preferred method uh, when we started this project. Um, so, what, the, reason, uh, the reason we we did this is we were on a very short time. We had one week to kind of make a decision on theming and we had no real uh, um, approach to it. And I made a unilateral decision on this specific issue and now a year and a half later, we are dealing with the repercussions which are um, we've had to, in turning into an agency from a product-focused company, we've had to begin tweaking hundreds of properties. So what we do now is whenever we make a change to any of the themable protocols, we open up a pull request on every single app. So we don't have a mono repo, we have a repo per app. Um, so that's how we're dealing with it right now. However, we have ideas for the future of theming. Um, so on the right, we have an image that was uh, created by one of, uh, one of our colleagues, Andrew Schoenfeld, who essentially took our classic app and broke it down to a couple dozen fonts, colors that are considered to be the primary colors and fonts. Um, what we plan on doing, um, or we're thinking about, 
and we haven't really agreed to it and we don't really know what the downside is going to be yet, is to essentially have a style.json file, or temporary name for the moment, um, that has all the tweakable elements possible, all hundreds upon hundreds of tweakable elements, all having pretty much every aspect of a button declared declaratively in JavaScript, and then have those specific values in style.json reference um, default values that are declared in superstyle.json, which is this superset of the primary, secondary, tertiary accent colors and fonts that are needed. From our experience, this will cover about 95% of all theming and will also be able to help us handle um, the very, um, very tiny use cases where not all buttons are the same color and not all fonts are used the same way. The classic example, by classic I mean quintessential example that we have, not the classic app. The quintessential example that I'm thinking of is our Globe and Mail application. They have red buttons everywhere except for a green button on a pre-prompt for push notifications. So they have a screen that pops up and says, hey, do you want to sign up for push notifications? And that button is green. You click yes, and then the actual push notification model pops up. It's the only green thing that they have in their entire app. It involved us to expose an entire button and set of um, themable properties that we didn't want to expose before just so we can turn it green. Um, obviously, we could have used appearance proxy, and we could have done like appearance proxy when UI button appears in this specific UI view, but we weren't sure to what level of extent we were need to do theming, so we just opened, put it into a themable um, protocol. All right, let's go to our persistence layer. Um, so when we started doing persistence, um, we had a, um, we used Realm. The reason we used Realm is because of myself and one of our other engineers had used Realm in a couple of other projects and we hated core data. And we needed to have a, um, a uh, very, uh, I guess, we need to have one relational database. We need to have a couple models that were, uh, had relationships with each other, parent-child relationships, and that was around sections. Um, and over time, PostKit, the monolithic repo that does everything, now is, uh, started handling uh, interactions with the sections API and now deals with that whole relationship. So we now don't need Realm. And when you're working on multiple apps at the same time that are making core changes to models, like such as adding a new analytics library, so one of our configuration files needs to hold serial keys for, let's say, Firebase, and then adding Google Analytics on another library or some other analytics platform, you start going into mer uh, migration issues just by merging things into a shared library, even before you start releasing this to the App Store. So we got into this horrible habit of nuking our, that just having a migration that runs every time that nukes everything. Um, because we didn't have to store any user data except saved articles, and we made the, you know, we made the decision that for at least one release, when we migrate away from Realm, we're gonna just nuke people's saved articles for specific apps, and for other apps, we'll try to do a migration. And what we came up with was this uh, codable-backed system that uh, over NS File Manager um, that we call Entities because we just couldn't think of a better name. Um, so the way Entities works is we have an Entities Managing Protocol, and that protocol defines the six main configuration files in the app. Um, and those configuration files are these codable-backed models. Then, um, Let's say we're not doing any type of overriding of those configuration files. Those are set onto a manager, and that manager is referenced by this front-end system we call Entities, which I will show you a screenshot in a moment of some code. And Entities performs a bunch of operations with the disk cache. But what we do is we take this codable-backed JSON model, and we add a bunch of other metadata around it and create what is known in the industry as a data transfer object. So the data transfer object essentially is this entities object that has information about its backup config file that is stored in the app, decryption key information, and some other metadata that it needs, and it takes all of that and stores that to disk. And then when changes need to be made, it'll unwrap it from disk and shoot it right back up and make it, make it available on the app. Um, using the, doing it this way, we don't need to worry about migrations, doing, we don't need to worry about um, a lot of other things that I don't want to give away until the next two slides. So entities as a whole is just a generic, um, uh, sorry, it is a, a, pretty much a get and set over, uh, that's constrained to uh, models that are of type codable, and then we do some meta type programming to um, essentially coordinate how, of, uh, how these models are set and get and set from the disk. And then you'll see in this gray, because I don't know why Dexset did this, we'll have this environment variable. 
So what this allowed us to do is to enable environment switching in our apps. Um, so environment switching means shifting from development to staging production live on the app. Um, so because we no longer dealt with one model called, let's say, main configuration file um, that was set to a specific environment, because we were dealing with JSON files that could be stored on disk, that all could be named main config and just have some other way of separating the name, like delimiting the name, like main config dev, main config prod, we were now able to do hot switching on the app. And the reason this is important for us is um, we have a lot of partners who, when we would deploy features, would require us to deploy three test flight builds. So they, they could test a certain set of features on prod versus dev versus their own app store builds. Um, and the things that they usually test are rejiggering the section front layouts and checking production content against test paywall APIs. So this, this was a boon to us. This was actually subsidized by one of our partners. They wanted it so badly that they shoved it into our timeline, and now this is now subsidized and available on all our platforms. And this has saved us a ton of time with respect to deployment. Um, so let's go from here to um, CocoaPods and Analytics Kit. So thanks to uh, the work of Sam, who's here today, and another engineer from Google and a few others, we now have Static Frameworks. Um, and Static Frameworks are great with uh, analytics libraries because analytics libraries are usually binary static frameworks um, or binary static libraries. And if you ha try to ingest a binary static library into a dynamically distributed library that sits in between, it won't work because of how the information that needs to be known at compile time versus runtime with respect to each library. So what we do on our end is we have our app, right? Configuration, JSON, structure layer with those partner.swift files. Then we have the actual app itself in CoreKit. CoreKit depends on Analytics Kit, and Analytics Kit has a bunch of subspects, dozens right now. This is just a snapshot of a few, uh, around Omniture, Comscore, Firebase, and a few others. And what we've essentially done is created a um, subspect-based architecture. We use subspects everywhere. Why? Because let's say the Salt Lake Tribune wants Firebase. They don't want to get access to SDKs from Omniture or Comscore bloating their entire app by 100 megabytes. So using the subspec architecture and having static frameworks allows us to create very specific um, Omniture-specific files that depend on the Omniture SDK and keep them in Analytics Kit and then bring them in. What we used to do before is keep a copy of these provider files. And these provider files essentially set the rules on how events that come in from the app are translated into Omniture's language or Firebase's language. What this allows us to do is actually continue to keep those files in Analytics Kit instead of what we used to do, which is create copies of these libraries and bring in these apps, uh, bring in these SDKs at the app level. So uh, the example would be in our classic app, our Rainbow app, we would import Firebase directly versus importing Firebase through Analytics Kit um, and keeping a source of truth in Analytics Kit that we would reference and have to keep up to date. Um, so this was a massive boon to us um, at the post because it, it, this literally is one of the reasons we, were a, a, uh, we, we have been uh, able to scale as fast as we are scaling now. Um, let's talk about CI and CD now. Um, we use BuddyBuild. Uh, we love BuddyBuild. I love BuddyBuild a lot. Um, we still use BuddyBuild now, even though they were acquired by Apple, because we were one of their uh, bigger partners. Um, so we, uh, what BuddyBuild does, it has built-in CI. It's, it's like Fastlane without any YAML files. You just have a bunch of knobs that you need to tweak, and everything just works. Um, the way we tested it, and the way I would like to test anything moving forward, is we took every single product on the market at the time, Circle, Travis, Bitrise, and BuddyBuild, and did all their free trials all at once, and then hooked them up to a couple of repos. And then we just saw how they acted. And more often than not, Circle, Travis, and Bitrise would fail because their VMs would run out of memory, which is if your VM runs out of memory, what's the point of using that CI system? That's why we stopped using Xcode bots. Xcode bots just suck on older hardware. So that's how we got to using BuddyBuild. We love BuddyBuild so much that we did a white paper with them. Um, so this was on their website at some point where we talked about in depth um, why, how we used it. I'm really happy that they were acquired by Apple because now all of you are going to be able to use it within the next couple of years when whatever it is that they're doing with Apple comes out to the public. Um, so we are heavy, heavy in the CI, CD. What our, essentially what our workflow looks like is um, we merge something into our mainline branch, buddy build hits off, passes, runs through all our tests, deploys it to test flight or ad hoc builds because buddy build has its own hockey app style 
ad hoc distribution platform, and our partners get it, and they just begin testing. So essentially, just doing one quick merge, uh, uh, one quick merge is, is all we need to do to make our customer happy. So let's talk about open source. As Louis mentioned earlier on, I love open source. I talked about it last year. I love contributing open source, but I hate using everyone else's open source projects. Um, not because of anything against you all, it's just I've been burned too many times by projects that are no longer maintained or projects that are not updated in time or that just have um, glaring bugs that, or, that are not going to be um, pulled in. So do we use open source of the post? Yes. How many do we, uh, libraries do we use? Nine. Um, not including you know, analytics SDKs that can be some that are open, some that are closed, and some downstream SDKs that I'm not recalling right now. But these are the nine main libraries we use. And the reason we've chosen these is some of the, they just existed in our classic app. However, these are the best in class, in our opinion, for um, what it is that they do. So Cocoa Lumberjack for logging, SV Progress HUD for having a little heads up display pop up, R Encryptor for uh, encoding and decoding um, uh, files securely, Mocking J for mocking your API requests. And then we have, uh, fail, uh, what's it called, first party libraries, so things that we've built in. So failable is a library, is a, is a the results type or the either monad that kind of returns a success or failure. So the way we use it is on completion handlers. So anytime we have a completion handler, we return something of type failable, and then we can unwrap the results through a switch statement through case, you know, case success or case false, uh, case failed. And then we use freedom, which is a library I built last summer um, about uh, being able to launch articles, um, share articles or launch articles in a share sheet to any browser that's currently supported because not everyone uses Safari. And then we have Siren, which is app updating, which you can look online on my GitHub. Um, so this is where we are now. Um, this, and so where are we going in the future? Uh, so we have the, um, we have an SDK offering. The end goal here, or one of the many end goals that we have is to be able to allow engineering, uh, publishers who have engineering teams um, but don't want to build a massive news app against our back end to be able to take core kit and then just theme it themselves and maintain it themselves and maybe add features themselves. Um, so we've already begun doing this. We have a partner um, that is going to go live soon with this SDK. Um, however, it is a pain to maintain. Why? We built everything in Swift. Swift is not ABI stable meaning that every time we bake a closed source binary in Swift, we need to target a specific tool chain. Each version of Xcode ships with its own tool chain. So um, thankfully, we are releasing this as beta software, so we are going to force our partners to update on our schedule. So if we are currently not on Xcode 10, we are not going to produce a tool chain, uh, a version that works against the Xcode 10 tool chain until we're ready to do it. When, hopefully, we'll have ABI stability next year, this will no longer be a problem. Um, automating upstream PRs. Whenever we make changes on um, PushKit, Analytics Kit, or any of these other libraries that we have, um, we want the ability for them to update our other libraries, to, update, uh, to merge into CoreKit or our other upstream apps. So, so far we have this, however, it could be done better. Um, you can ask me about it later if you want. So we're starting to automate things as much as we can. We're trying to actually get to a point where we can create an app by pushing a button on a web CMS. We're trying to automate the entire onboarding away. So right now, uh, our first app took nine months to make. Our, our current apps take about two, two months to make from start to finish. Theming in general right now takes two hours. However, it's everything else, the custom features that need to be done that take the other, uh, what's it called, uh, eight weeks to do. We're trying to get to a point right now where we have locked down what our feature set is, shift back from being an agency to a product company, and just have the client provide us fonts and themes and um, uh, iconography and imagery online, and then push a button to, gener to spin up a GitHub repo, set up a, a brand new app with custom theming, and then actually do any development that we need to do and shepherd the app to the App Store. So we're trying to turn this into like a one-week deployment time from start to finish. And that's why one of the reasons we're gonna be rewriting our entire theming engine to be JSON-based, so we can share it with the web. And the other thing we want to do is get away from having six configuration files and switch back to having one secure configuration file that will be able to take all of these models that we have and parsers that we have around different analytics libraries like, um, uh, like Verve or Google DFP ads or Firebase and kind of put them in a configuration library called ConfigKit and then import them as needed and parse them as needed. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. But let me give you some little more knowledge because everyone likes to know how teams are structured and they work. 
So we do all native development. Obviously, you would possibly, probably you would think that, hey, if you're scaling and you're building cross-platform applications, React Native or Flutter or some other hybrid tech, PhoneGap, who knows, would be a better approach. We're not doing that. Um, it's not that we don't want to do it. It's just, well, we don't. A lot of us don't want to do JavaScript development. Um, uh, the other reason is it's really hard to hire engineers in DC or very, very, you know, hire, you know, very um, advanced engineers in, uh, in DC. So we kind of try to operate in what con are considered to be the norms. So the norms are Swift right now and, and Kotlin plus Java. So all our development is in Swift or Kotlin and Java. We use MVC. Why? It's not that we don't want to use Viper. It's just that MVC works and everyone understands MVC out of the box. We can have a developer come in and submit code. Hell, we have an intern. The intern is here today. He literally submitted a brand new feature and presented to the client within 72 hours because he knows MVC. Everyone knows MVC. That is our goal. So it's not that we don't use these other frameworks. I mean, we have builders, we have view models, we have data models, we have factory. We have everything that you could possibly think of. But we just have minimum view controllers. Our view controllers are very tiny. Um, and if you haven't noticed, we use protocol-oriented programming. Our entire scaling architecture, at least on iOS, is, thank, is, is able to be built this way because of POP. So what's our process like? Um, we use Git flow, meaning we have a develop branch, which is our mainline branch. We have a master branch that keeps track of our previous releases that we can quickly cut a new build off to do, to, uh, do a hot fix. We have feature branches and bug fix branches and release branches. Every, all the code comes in via detailed pull requests with mandatory pull request templates. Um, then, depending on the engineers that are reviewing it, we, of which we usually have two, um, one of them will most likely hop on a phone call or a Slack call and do a code review, or if they're in person, they'll do it in person, just to make sure there's at least two engineers that understand what the hell is being added or fixed at any point in time. We have rituals. We have a daily scrum uh, where we do iOS, Android, um, backend, um, QA, and product. 15, 16, 15 or 16 people for 15 minutes. We have a daily check-in for 30 minutes where we kind of go into more detail. This is just iOS only, the, da the daily check-in, where we talk about, hey, what's on, the what's, what's on the map today? Who needs help? What PRs haven't merged in? Is there a demo today? Because we have demos every week. And then we have a weekly Kanban. Kanban. It's actually a scrumban in the sense that we meet every Friday. We pull tickets from the backlog in the order of priority. Um, and we assign story points, story points only to figure out how, what your capacity is. But we don't actually care about your velocity because we've realized that we usually get all our work done because we assign something like eight to 10 points. Uh, and again, that means nothing here, I realize, because you don't know what our, how we distribute points. But the point is, we are a Kanban system stuck on one week scrum, scrum sprints. It works. You can ask me about it later if you want. Um, what's our team structure? And this is the part that I'm kind of proud of. We're all remote, or most of us are remote. Um, for the most part, you know, our team structure has changed recently slightly, but we've had uh, me. I'm in Baltimore. I work remote full time. I come into the office once or twice a month. Um, we have three senior devs. One's in DC, one's in Denver, and one's in Tallahassee. We have two junior mid developers. One's in Manhattan, one was in Cincinnati. He just moved down here. And we have one or two interns every summer. And this is what our structure's been like for two years now. Um, and this works. So I am a huge proponent of remote work because if you have the right people that are self-motivated, they will build amazing things. We are building pretty much the entire news, top news category in the App Store right now. And this is all done by this setup. A few of us are here today, so if you have any questions about working at the Post or just um, about our architecture, you can ask anyone except Dustin because he works on the Classic app and the Rainbow app. But he'll be happy to answer questions for you anyway. Um, thank you for listening to us, and thank you for listening to me about this project. Um, there's, it says that I have five minutes left. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to answer questions, but yes, no. Okay, I got the thumbs up. Does anyone have any questions? Everyone understood everything. Everyone loved everything. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, you have a question? Yes. Sorry, can you speak up a little bit? Um, eventually, down the line. So what we do is we have um, a listener, and we listen to the, so we have events that come through Unicorn, and those events are formatted a specific way. Then they propagate down through uh, a listener. The listener then goes through a translator. So Omniture has a file called Omniture Translator that conforms to a translation protocol. Um, 
and we translate all those events. Um, Omnisher, as an example, is this, uh, has a system where it used to convert everything to these abstract numbers. So you would have, um, it, let's say you have an event like did scroll down 50% of article. So we would write on the unicorn side, did scroll 50%. Um, however, on Omniture, they would convert it to um, event 20. So we would have to translate that event before sending it through to Omniture. And then we would send it to Omniture after the translation layer was done. And then we would send it into their SDK, and their SDKs usually have a store and forward policy, meaning they'll store it for, I don't know, a few minutes, maybe a, a few hours before sending the events through as a big payload. So all we do is just translate, listen and translate events before letting the, SD, the specific SDKs handle how that stuff is um, sent to the, data, uh, the database online. Does that help? Awesome. Yes? So, sure. So most of our, when you buy an ARC publishing, um, I, wanna, I don't want to say membership, when you are onboarded onto our platform, we stand up your backend for you. We own your backend. The only custom third-party APIs we really have to work with are your paywalls. And for that, we have paywall protocols. Paywall networking is our protocol that pretty much defines uh, login, logout, uh, social authentication, uh, verify subscription, link a subscription, how to deal with in-app purchases, and we just hook it up that way. Um, so we figured out over time what every paywall has because we've worked with four or five paywalls now and essentially there's very minor differences. The only differences are how authentication is done because some are done through web views and some are done natively. Yes? So, okay. <laughs> Uh, we actually had a massive discussion about this. So um, one thing you need to know about our, our team is that we're fractured down the middle. There are about 24 iOS, uh, sorry, 24 mobile engineers. 12 or 13 work, uh, 20, 12 or 13 are iOS. Half of them, as I said, work on um, Arc, Arc Mobile. So we have a team meeting every Thursday where we meet with the other side of the house, the people who work on the Classic and Rainbow. And we have essentially... One of my counterparts uh, is an individual who I'm not gonna name. He's extremely gung-ho about doing things a very specific way. Like, he hates Codable because it's slow. He hates protocols. He doesn't hate protocols. He just doesn't like the way we're using it on the Arc side because of the theming debacle. So his opinion is, let's use static frameworks. And I tend to agree with him on this because um, I think at the end of the day, you'll have um, a slower compilation time, but launch time is much faster because I think Apple hasn't found a way to optimize uh, doing the dynamic linking. Um, so what we've essentially done is we've turned almost every library into a static framework at this point in time. However, as you said, the speaker that's coming on later will have a better explanation than I will. So we're for it and we use it on almost every library. And most of it is because downstream dependencies come in statically, like ads and analytics. So every upstream dependency, analytics kit and ads kit at this point, have to become static. And because core kit depends on it, core kit is static as well. However, paywall isn't static because paywall has no third party dependency. Pushkit, isn't sta uh, Pushkit is static, because I think it depends on a couple like Urban Airship or uh, some other platform that is static. So it really depends on the pr provider. And because we prefer to have this Cocoa Pod subspec based architecture for bringing in downstream pods, we have to like static frameworks, but we do. And you learn a little bit more about the team in the process of answering this question. Anything else? I have 26 seconds. Uh, <laughs> 11 minutes. Recomp recompilation is down to 12 seconds. Uh, I forgot how we did that. Something, some, something, some magic. Yeah, it's about 11 minutes. It's, it sucks. Uh, anything else? Cool, thanks very much.